Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel, Part 2, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Chapter 10. The problem with the Traveling Symphony was the same problem suffered by every group of people everywhere since before the collapse, undoubtedly since well before the beginning of recorded history. Start, for example, with the third cello. He had been waging a war of attrition with Dieter for some months following a careless remark Dieter had made about the perils of practicing an instrument in dangerous territory, the way the notes can carry for a mile on a clear day. Dieter hadn't noticed. Dieter did, however, harbor considerable resentment towards the second horn because of something she'd once said about his acting. This resentment didn't go unnoticed. The second horn thought he was being petty. But when the second horn was thinking of people she didn't like very much, she ranked him well below the seventh guitar. There weren't really actually seven guitars in the symphony, but the guitarists had a tradition of not changing their numbers when another guitarist died or left, so that currently the symphony roster included guitars four, seven, and eight, with the location of the sixth presently in question, because they were done rehearsing a Midsummer's Night's Dream in the Walmart parking lot, they were hanging the Midsummer's Night's Dream backdrop between the caravans. They'd been in St. Deborah by the water for hours now, and why hadn't he come to them? Anyway, the seventh guitar, whose eyesight was so bad he couldn't do most of the routine tasks that had to be done, the repairs and hunting and such, which would have been fine if he'd found some other way to help out, but he hadn't. He was essentially dead weight as far as the second horn was concerned. The seventh guitar was a nervous person, because he was nearly blind. He'd been able to see reasonably well with an extremely thick pair of glasses, but he'd lost these six years ago, and since then he'd lived in a confusing landscape distilled to pure color according to season. Summer mostly green, winter mostly gray and white, in which blurred figures swam into view, then receded before he could figure out who they were. He couldn't tell if his headaches were caused by straining to see uh, or by his anxiety at never being able to see what was coming. But he did know the situation wasn't helped by the first flute, who had a habit of sighing loudly whenever the seventh guitar had to stop rehearsal to ask for clarification on the score that he couldn't see. But the first flute was less irritated by the seventh guitar than she was by the second violin, August, who was forever missing rehearsals, always off somewhere, breaking into another house with Kirsten, and until recently, Charlie, like he thought the symphony was a scavenging outfit who played music on the side. If he wanted to join a scavenging outfit, she'd said to the fourth guitar, why didn't he just join a scavenging outfit? You know what the violins are like, the fourth guitar had said. August was annoyed by the third violin, who liked to make insinuating remarks about August and Kirsten even though they'd only ever been close friends and had in fact made a secret pact to this effect, friends forever and nothing else. Sworn while drinking with locals one night behind the ruins of a bus depot in some town on the south end of Lake Huron, and the third violin resented the first violin following a long, long ago argument about who had used the last of, the last of a batch of rosin while the first violin was chilly to Saeed because Saeed had rejected her overtures in favor of Kirsten, who'd expended considerable energy in trying to ignore the viola's habit of dropping random French words into sentences as though anyone else in the entire goddamn symphony spoke French, while the viola harbored secret resentments against someone else, and so on and so forth, etc., and this collection of petty jealousies, neuroses, undiagnosed PTSD cases, and simmering resentments lived together, traveled together, rehearsed together, performed together, 365 days of the year, permanent company, permanent tour. But what made it bearable were the friendships, of course, the camaraderie in the music and the Shakespeare, the moments of transcendent beauty and joy when it didn't matter who use the last of the rosin on their bow, or who anyone had slept with, although someone, probably Saeed, had written Sartre, hell is other people, in pen inside one of the caravans, and someone else had scratched out other people and substituted flutes. <laughs> people left the symphony sometimes 
but the ones who stayed understood something that was rarely spoken aloud. Civilization in year 20 was an archipelago of small towns. These towns had fought off ferals, buried their neighbors, lived and died, and suffered together in the blood-drenched years just after the collapse, survived against unspeakable odds, and then only by holding together into the calm, and these places didn't go out of their way to welcome outsiders. Small towns weren't even easy before, August said once at three in the morning. The one time Kirsten remembered talking about this with anyone in the cold of a spring night near the town of New Phoenix. She was 15 at the time, which made August 18, and she'd only been with the symphony for a year. In those days, she had considerable trouble sleeping and often sat up with the night watch. August remembered his pre-pandemic life as an endless sequence of kids who looked him over and uttered variations on, You're not from around here, are you? In various accents, these encounters interspersed with moving trucks. If it was hard to break into new places then, in that ludicrously easy world where food was on shelves in supermarkets and travel was as easy as taking a seat in a gasoline-powered machine and water came out of taps, it was several orders of magnitude more difficult now. The symphony was insufferable. Hell was other flutes or people or whoever had used the last of the rosin and whoever missed the most rehearsals, but the truth was the symphony was their only home. At the end of the Midsummer's Night's Dream rehearsal, Kirsten stood by the caravans with the palms of her hands pressed hard to her forehead, trying to will away a headache. You okay? August asked. Hell is other actors, Kirsten said. Also, ex-boyfriends. Stick to musicians. I think you're generally sane. I think we're generally saner. I'm going to take a walk and see if I can find Charlie. I'd come with you, but I'm on dinner duty. I don't mind going alone, she said. A late afternoon torpor had fallen over the town, the light thickening and shadows extending over the road. The road was disintegrating here and every here as everywhere, deep fissures and potholes holding gardens of weeds. There were wildflowers along the vegetable patches at the edge of the pavement, Queen Anne's lace whispering against Kirsten's outstretched hand. She passed by the motor lodge where the oldest families in town lived. Laundry flapping in the breeze, doors open on motel rooms, a little boy playing with a toy car between the tomato plants and the vegetable garden. The pleasure of being alone for once, away from the clamor of the symphony. It was possible to look up at the McDonald's sign and fleetingly imagine, by keeping her gaze directed upward, so that there was only the sign in the sky, that this was still the former world and she could stop in for a burger. The last time she'd been here, the IHOP had housed three or four families. She was surprised to see that it had been boarded up, a plank hammered across the door with an inscrutable symbol spray-painted in silver, something like a lowercase t with an extra line towards the bottom. Two years ago, she'd been followed around town by a flock of children, but now she saw only two, the boy with the toy car and a girl of 11 or so who watched her from a doorway. A man with a gun and a reflective sunglasses was standing guard at the gas station whose windows were blocked by curtains that had once been flowered sheets. A young and very pregnant woman sunbathed in a lounge chair by the gas pumps, her eyes closed. The presence of an armed guard in the middle of town suggested that the place was unsafe. Had they recently been raided? But surely that was... But surely not as unsafe as all that if a pregnant woman was sunbathing in the open. It didn't quite make sense. The McDonald's had housed two families, but where had they gone? Now a board had been nailed across the door, spray painted with that same odd symbol. The Wendy's was a low square building with the look of having been slapped together from a kit in an architecturally careless era, but it had a beautiful front door. It was a replacement, solid wood and someone had taken the trouble to carve a row of flowers alongside the carved handle. Kirsten ran her fingertips over the wooden petals before she knocked. How many times had she imagined this moment over two years of traveling apart from her friend, knocking on the flowered door, Charlie answering with a baby in her arms, tears and laughter, the, the sixth guitar grinning beside her. I've missed you so much. 
but the woman who answered the door was unfamiliar. Good afternoon, Kirsten said. I'm looking for Charlie. I'm sorry, who? The woman's tone wasn't unfriendly, but there was no recognition in her eyes. She was about Kirsten's age or a little younger, and it seemed to Kirsten that she wasn't well. She was very pale and too thin, black circles under her eyes. Charlie. Charlotte Harrison. She was here about two years ago. Here in the Wendy's? Yes. Oh, Charlie, where are you? She's a friend of mine, a cellist. She was here with her husband, the sixth, her husband, Jeremy. She was pregnant. I've only been here a year, but maybe someone here would know. Would you like to come in? Kirsten stepped into an airless corridor. It opened into a common room at the back of the building where once there had been an industrial kitchen. She saw a cornfield through the back, open back door, stalks swaying for a dozen yards or so before the wall of the forest. An older woman sat in a chair by the doorway, knitting. Kirsten recognized the local midwife. Maria, she said. Maria was backlit by the open door behind her. It was impossible to see the expression on her face when she looked up. You're with the symphony, she said. I remember you. I'm looking for Charlie and Jeremy. I'm sorry, they've left town. Left? Why would they leave? Where did they go? The midwife glanced at the woman who'd shown Kirsten in. The woman looked at the floor. Neither spoke. At least tell me when, Kirsten said. How long have they been gone? A little more than a year. Did she have her baby? A little girl, Annabelle, perfectly healthy. And is that all you have to tell me? Kirsten was entertaining a pleasant fantasy of holding a knife to the midwife's throat. Alyssa, Maria said to the other woman, you look so pale, darling. Why don't you go lie down? Alyssa disappeared through a curtain doorway into another room. The midwife stood quickly. Your friend rejected the prophet's advances, she whispered, close to Kirsten's ear. They had to leave town. Stop asking questions and tell your people to leave here as quickly as possible. She settled back into her chair and picked up her knitting. Thank you for stopping by, she said in a loud voice, uh, enough to be heard in the next room. Is the symphony performing tonight? A Midsummer's Night's Dream with orchestral accompaniment. Kirsten was having trouble keeping her voice steady. That after two years the symphony might arrive in St. Deborah by the water to find that Charlie and Jeremy had already left was a possibility that hadn't occurred to her. This town seems different from when we were here last, she said. Oh, the midwife said brightly. It is. It's completely different. Kirsten stepped outside and the door closed behind her. The girl she'd noticed in a doorway earlier had followed her here and was standing across the road watching Kirsten follow watching Kirsten nodded to her the girl nodded back a serious child unkempt in a way that suggested neglect her hair tangled her t-shirt collar torn Kirsten wanted to call out to her to ask if she knew where Charlie and Jeremy had gone but something in the girl's stare unnerved her had someone told the girl to watch her Kirsten tuned turned away to continue down the road, wandering with studied casualness and trying to convey the impression of being interested only in the late afternoon light, the wildflowers, the dragonflies gliding on currents of air. When she glanced over her shoulder, the girl was trailing behind her at some distance. Two years ago, she'd done this walk with Charlie, both of them delaying the inevitable in the final hours before the symphony left. These two years will go quickly, Charlie had said, and they had gone quickly, when Kirsten considered it, up to King Cardin, back down to the coastline, down to Saint, the St. Saint Clair River, winter in one of the St. Clair fishing towns, performances of Hamlet and Lear in the town hall, which had previously been a high school gymnasium, the winter's tale, Romeo and Juliet, the musicians performing almost every night, then a midsummer's night's dream when the weather grew warmer, an illness had, that passed through the symphony in the spring, a high fever and vomiting, Half the symphony got sick, but everyone recovered except the third guitar, a grave by the roadside outside of New Phoenix. And we continued onward. Charlie, like always, all those months, and always I thought of you here in this town. There was someone on the road ahead, walking quickly to meet her. The sun was skimming the tops of the trees now, the road in shadow, and it was a moment before she recognized Dieter. We should be getting back, she said. I have to show you something first. You'll want to see this. 
What is it? She didn't like his tone. Something had rattled him. She told him that the midwife... She told him what the midwife had said while they walked. He frowned. She said they'd left? Are you sure that's what she said? Of course I'm sure. Why? At the northern edge of town, a new building had been under way at the very end. The foundation poured just before the Georgia flu arrived. It was a concrete pad, bristling with metal bars, overgrown now with vines. Dieter stepped off the road and led her down a path behind it. All towns have graveyards in St. Deborah by the water. In St. Deborah's, Deborah by the waters had grown considerably since she'd wandered here two years ago with Charlie. There were perhaps 300 graves spaced in neat rows between the abandoned foundation and the forest. In the newest section, freshly painted markers blazed white in the grass. She saw the names at some distance. No, she said. Oh no, please. It's not them, Dieter said. I have to show you this, but it isn't them. Three markers in a row in the afternoon shadows, names painted neatly in black, Charlie Harrison, Jeremy Lung, Annabelle, Infant, all three with the same date, July 20, year 19. It's not them, Dieter said again, look at the ground, no one's buried under those markers. The horror of seeing their names there, she was weakened by the sight, but he was right, she realized, the earliest markers at the far end of the graveyard were unmistakably planted above graves, the dirt mounded. The pattern continued through to a cluster of 30 graves from a year and a half ago, the dates of death within a two-week span. An illness, obviously, something that spread fast and vicious in the winter cold. But after this, the irregularities began. About half of the graves following the winter illness looked like graves, while the others, Charlie and Jeremy's and their babies among them, or markers driven into perfectly flat and undisturbed earth. It doesn't make sense, she said. We could ask your shadow. The girl who'd followed Kirsten through town was standing at the edge of the graveyard by the foundation watching them. You, Kirsten said. The girl stepped back. Did you know Charlie and Jeremy? The girl glanced over her shoulder. When she returned her gaze to Kirsten and Dieter, her nod was barely perceptible. Are they... Kirsten gestured toward the, towards the graves. They left, the girl said very quietly. It speaks, Dieter said. When did they? But the girl's ner nerve failed her before Kirsten could finish the question. She darted out of sight behind the foundation, and Kirsten heard fo footsteps on the road. Kirsten was left alone with Dieter, with the graves in the forest. They looked at one another, but there was nothing to say. A short time after they returned to the Walmart, the tuber returned to camp with his own report. He tracked down an acquaintance who had lived in the motel. There had been an epidemic, the man had told him. Thirty people had died uh, incandescent with fever, including the mayor. After this, a change in management, but the tuba's acquaintance had declined to elaborate on what he meant by this. He did say that twenty families had left since then, including Charlie and the sixth guitar and their baby. He said no one knew where they'd gone, and he told the two, but it was best not to ask. A change in management, the conductor said. How corporate of them. They discussed the grave markers at some length. What did the graves mark, if not deaths? Did the markers await a future event? I told you, Kirsten said. The midwife said there, were, there was a profit. Yeah, that's fantastic. Said was unpacking a crate of candles without looking at anyone. The sixth guitar was one of his closest friends. Just what every town needs. Someone else must know where they went, the conductor said. They must have told someone. Doesn't anyone else have friends here? I knew a guy who lived in the IHOP, the third cello said. But I checked earlier and it was boarded up. And then someone in the motor lodge said he'd left town last year. No one would tell me where Charlie and Jeremy went. No one tells you anything here, Kirsten wanted to cry, but instead she stared at the pavement, pushing a pebble back and forth with her foot. How could we have left them here? Lynn looked out her fairy costume, a silver cocktail dress that... Uh, excuse me, Lynn shook out her fairy costume, a silver cocktail dress that shimmered like the scales of a fish, and a cloud of dust rose into the air. Graves, she said. I can't begin to... Not graves, Dieter said. Grave markers. Towns change. Gil leaned on his cane 
by the third caravan, gazing at the buildings and gardens of St. Deborah by the water, at the haze of wildflowers along the edges of the road. The McDonald's sign caught the last of the sunlight. We couldn't have predicted. There could be an explanation, the third cello said, doubtful. They could have left and, I don't know, someone thought that they were dead? There's a prophet, Kirsten said. There are grave markers with their names on them. The midwife said I should stop asking questions and that we should leave quickly. Did I mention that? Did we not acknowledge you loudly enough for the first six times you mentioned it? Saeed asked. The conductor sighed. We can't leave till we know more, she said. Let's get on with the evening and we'll make inquiries after the show. The caravans were parked end to end, the Midsummer Night's Dream backdrop, sewn together sheets, grimy now from years of travel, painted with the forest scene, hung on them. Alexandra and Olivia had gathered branches and flowers to complete the effect, and a, com and a hundred candles marked the edges of the stage. I was talking to our fearless leader, August said to Kirsten later, between tuning the in his instruments and going to join the rest of the string section, and she thinks Charlie and the sixth guitar must have gone south down the lake shore. Why south? Because west to water, they didn't go north. We would have run into them on the road. The sun was setting. The citizens of St. Deborah by the Water gathered for the performance. Far fewer of them now than there had been. No more than thirty in two grim-faced rows on the grid of the former parking lot. A wolfish gray dog lay on its side at the end of the front row, its tongue lolling. The girl who had followed Kirsten was nowhere in sight. Is there anything to the south, though? August shrugged. It's a lot of coastline, he said. There's got to be something between here and Chicago, wouldn't you think? They could have gone inland. It's possible, but they know we never go into the interior. They'd, go, they'd only go inland if they didn't want to see us again. And why would they? He shook his head. None of it made sense. They had a girl, Kirsten said. Annabelle. That was Charlie's sister's name. Places, the conductor said, and August left to join the strings.